All right, please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This evening we'll look at how to speak in tongues. I know you've been looking forward to that all last week. I had some people call me in uh, languages I could not understand. I think that uh, was what they were discussing with some of y'all practicing uh, this last week. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And uh, look forward to getting right into Scripture here and looking at what the Bible says and knowing with confidence in a way that not only can we be settled about what we know God says, but in a way that we can help other people be settled in what God says. Some years ago I realized that um, being a believer and discipling other believers isn't rocket surgery. It isn't something that's so complicated that it is beyond... Yeah, I said rocket surgery. Uh, beyond, it, it isn't something that is beyond our scope or our ability to do. Matter of fact, most of what people don't know, you know. If you've been growing in your faith for years, everything you've learned, you actually know. Uh, I remember my freshman year of college not feeling like I'd learned a great deal. And part of that was because of you know freshman courses like grammar and history and uh, prerequisites before you get into your particular major. And uh, But I, I remember when after my senior year before you graduated, you had to take your Bible comprehensive exam. And I remember taking my Bible comprehensive exam and doing well on it and thinking when I took it, you know something, I don't think I could have passed this before I went to college. And I'm not sure where along the line I learned everything that I learned in college, but I did pick it up. I did learn it. And sometimes, you know, when you learn things one thing at a time, you don't realize you've gathered a lot. But as a believer, if you've been growing in your faith, you've learned a lot, and you can share, and you can help other believers. Did you know that someone that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior knows far less than you do, and so then you could teach and you could tell people? So when you learn truths of the Scripture, I would, I would encourage you, I would urge you to be a student about it. In other words, don't just say, yes, yes, that's true, but make sure that you can remember where it's at in the Bible. Make sure um, when you're thinking about it, that you're trying to think, is there anyone that I could teach this to or that I could share this with that would help them in their faith or encourage them, especially if it's encouraging. Especially if it's encouraging. Man, if you know something and you know someone who's struggling with something, that you could just say, hey, here's a truth, here's a fact from the Word of God that will encourage you. And this could be one of those things. This could be an area where someone is just struggling and they don't know what way to go. It's a matter of uh, specifically this evening, our text deals specifically, <clears throat> excuse me, with the matter of speaking in tongues. Now, we've been really, this is the third part of uh, really one message. We began in chapter 12 a couple of weeks ago looking at the purpose of spiritual gifts. And that purpose of spiritual gifts would be uh, that the church, that the body would profit with all. That is, the gifts are given so that everyone in the church can profit by it. God does not gift you supernaturally for your own edification. God gives every one of us for the edification of one another. This whole selfishness, this whole take care of yourself, this is really not a believer's concept. Uh, I understand what someone's saying when they say, if you're not well, you're not in the position to help someone else be well. We could agree with that, couldn't we? But you know what that means? It means get well so you can help others. It doesn't mean just spend your whole life dealing with yourself and your selfish issues. If you, will. if you have an issue that's ongoing in your life spiritually and you don't get victory over it, there's a certain point when it becomes about you, where it becomes my life's about me and you're not living for Jesus and you're not living for others. And that'll be a, that'll be a barrier in your life. That'll be, a, that'll be a, like just hitting a wall and stopping you. And so this could be one of those areas where you could really be a blessing to others. So the first purpose of spiritual gifts is that the church, that others may profit with all. And again, we do profit, don't we, from one another being there. Listen, I want to just tell you something. Your being here this evening, and I mean you, your being here this evening means the world to me. And it would be far less of a wonderful meeting tonight if you weren't here. That's just a fact. That's the truth. Your being here means the world to me, and it would be far less of a blessing if you weren't here tonight. And... Uh, your, your place, whatever it is. Uh, we were talking this last week with the folks that have been helping with our Miami Beach church plan. We are talking about just the importance of having people when you start a church and a ministry and people on a church planning team. And uh, there's a phrase we use sometimes, warm bodies. You know, uh, I remember when I was in high school, 
we uh, in, in one one Christian school that I went to, uh, there were a couple of things that were optional as far as electives. They were called electives because you could elect to take them, but nobody opted out of the electives. That's how the principal would put it. He'd say, he'd say, well, choir is an elective. That's not technically required. He said, everybody goes to choir, but you're not required to. Kind of like he said, yeah, you could stay back in study hall, except that there's no study hall monitor, so that wouldn't be an option. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you got into choir. And um, we played football and basketball. We were a small Christian school, and we needed everybody on the team in football and in basketball. We just, we just needed subs. Sometimes people out there running up and down the court really couldn't do much other than be there. And sometimes you could just get in the way of somebody or something, but we called them warm bodies. And, you know, you had about four or five guys that could play ball and basketball, and then you had a bench, you know, of, about five guys that were just bodies on the bench. And I'll tell you something, every game we won, we couldn't have won without our bench. Think of that. Sometimes you think, well, what I'm doing with my role, my gift, it's not so important. Well, try it without it. You know, if you're required to have uh, four guys in order for there to be a game on the court and you've only got three, you can't play. And just be surprised at how sometimes we think that our role or our spiritual gift is insignificant, and it isn't so at all. And so remember that with spiritual gifts. Then we saw that any spiritual gift without charity is noise. It's just noise. It it's, attracts attention, makes a racket, but it doesn't have any profit. And we saw that we were supposed to uh, covet the best gifts at the end of chapter 12. Last week, though, we looked at the matter of tongues versus prophecy, and we defined tongues last week. In our context, we saw that tongues actually are languages. They're real languages. And uh, that the, a tongue that doesn't have a meaning, a language that doesn't have words without meanings, is like an instrument that gives an uncertain sound. You can blow a trumpet, and you know it's a trumpet. You can hit a note on a piano, and you know it's a piano. You can uh, play strings, and you know what strings are. Uh, every sound signifies something or means something. Um, if you, of course, we know certain sounds, don't we? Da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum. That's when they're about to start a basketball game, right? <laughs> I think that's what that's about. Okay, there's certain. What does that signify? What does that sound signify? Every girl knows, right? I mean, I don't know how many little girls I've seen with all this. Uh, what do they call that stuff? That uh, lacy looking junk they put tool that's what they call it. I don't know why they call it tools not tools but they put it all over them I remember my sister and my cousin you know out and I mean walking around da -da, da -da. Yeah, every girl pretending to be a bride you know and that sort of thing well it sounds signifies something doesn't it how about this one Doo -doo 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 -doo. Charge. charge okay you guys are the military you guys know certain sounds and what they mean right and in battle, certainly it used to be that certain, uh, uh, there would be sounds that would be charged. There would be sounds that would be fall back. There would be sounds that would be go left, go right. Uh, you know, um, And those sounds had meaning. In the same way, a tongue has a meaning. So the babbling context of speaking in tongues, that is an individual getting up and speaking in an unidentifiable, unintelligible language, is not what the Bible gift of tongues actually is. The example, of course, is Pentecost, when every man heard them speak in his own language, glossa, which is tongue or language. And so, you know, I think that some individuals have taken advantage of the infrequently used word tongue in, in our language to sort of make something different than uh, glossa or language. But tongue means language. That's what it means. Let me, you say, well, I don't know exactly what you mean by that, Pastor. Well, it's sort of like the use of the word wine. Today, when people are talking about the extract from fruit, to use the phrase wine, people today assume it's fermented or alcoholic, don't they? But the word wine doesn't mean, it just means fruit of the vine. It means coming from the vine. Now, it can be fermented, it can be strong drink, and, and the context of wine always shows what kind it is. But wine is juice. That's what the word wine means. And so some people boil it down. They just say, 
uh, you know, wine is alcohol, juice. Well, where's the word juice used in the Bible? See, the word wine is the word that's used for fruit of the vine. And so the, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, sometimes false doctrines, false teaching comes from an aberration or a misunderstanding of the actual use of the word. And tongue is one of those words. In other words, in the church, the word tongue, because it's not frequently used to mean language, or la usually we use the word language in, our, in the English instead of the word tongue, sometimes people think it means you know, the incoherent babbling. When they talk about speaking in tongues, instantly what most people think of is what happens oftentimes in some fellowships where people uh, stand up and babble incoherently. And they would say this is being filled with the Spirit. And that isn't actually what the Scripture defines it as. We saw that last couple of weeks. So we won't review that, but you could go uh, online probably by next week and find that message uh, on, on our YouTube page. And it would be a real help to you. Now, let's read verse 20. And let's just pray for the Lord's help tonight. I want to just uh, hit some highlights and about, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six things specifically about how to speak in tongues tonight. So verse 20 of Acts chapter 14. Brethren, be not children in understanding. How about it? How be it in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. Love that verse. Let's pray. Father, please help us this evening to understand the philosophy in which we understand spiritual gifts. And we ask that we would be able to convey that same understanding to other aspects and avenues of our lives. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, there are a couple of things that Paul just mentions about speaking in tongues appropriately. In verse 13 of chapter 14, he said, Wherefore, let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So he prefers interpretation over uh, speaking in a, t in a language. Uh, and then verse 16, he said, Else when thou shalt bless... With the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? So if people don't understand what's being said, there isn't much value there. He emphasizes that again. Look at verse 22 and 23. This is the philosophy for speaking in tongues. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, for, but for them which believe. Now, notice this reason. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Okay, so his point is that if somebody comes in and they see everybody speaking in tongues and in in these languages. And again, it's not because it's babbling, but because they don't understand it. And especially if they know that you speak a different language than the one you are speaking. And say, have they lost their mind? Are they crazy? You ever met somebody after they've lost it a little bit? So when they've gone out of their minds? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a little frightening, isn't it? To see somebody who's mad or insane. They're out of their mind. And we're not supposed to behave as though we are mad or insane in the church. So, tongues are for a sign not to the believer, but to the unbeliever. In other words, in Pentecost, when the gospel was preached in the, the language of the people who were there for the celebration of Pentecost, and they heard individuals that were known to be unlearned and ignorant as the disciples were, they would have been fishermen, Galileans, maybe like Southerners, like people that support the laundry detergent team. They would uh, be, uh, <laughs> I don't know why I can't, uh, the Galileans were Southerners. Uh, anyway, they would know, hey, these people are uneducated. And they, they cheer for laundry detergent and that sort of thing. Well, that would be the equivalent of in their day. But now we're hearing them speak in a language that they don't know. So the question was, the question actually is, then, how are we hearing them in our own language? Well, their first thought, their first guess was they're drunk. But, you know, Peter pointed out, usually when people are drunk and they don't become more intelligent. They become less intelligent, isn't it so? Mm -hmm. And so that wouldn't be true. He said, these are filled with the Holy Ghost. And, the, and so the witness of the message was that they were speaking in tongues by the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the message had an increased effectiveness as a result. And they were pricked to the heart. And literally the same people that were <clears throat> crying out just 
really more than a month before crucify him, believed in Jesus and were added to the church. And that's the results of the of unbelievers seeing tongues used in the miraculous sense or miraculous way in which God intended. Now this evening, I said last week, we're going to look at how speaking tongues. Let's dive right in. Let's just go ahead and hit some highlights of it. There, I'm not saying this is all the passage of Scripture says about this. There's a lot that you could dig deeper and, and get to. But uh, look at verse 26. How is it then, brethren, when you come together? Every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Now, Paul here is pointing out that it's just a little bit too busy when y'all get together. This probably my wife could understand uh, as well, what you would... This is what my wife would call a Price family get-together with the, with the Krause family added into it, my dad's twin sister and uh, the cousins and so forth. Whenever they're there uh, at any get-together, it just becomes like, well, it becomes very entertaining. My wife says my family could very, very easily be a soap opera, you know, just with, it's just, they're just very, very, a lot of characters. Is he not soap opera? What do you call it, sitcom? I don't know the difference between the two. So I don't watch any TV, so. <laughs> but a sitcom says, we're very entertaining. My grandma is incredibly entertaining. My dad's entertaining. My dad's sister's entertaining. My cousins are entertaining. Matter of fact, they will entertain you. They'll, I mean, they'll be instruments playing, and there will be performances. I mean, it is a performance when my family get together, and it's like they're all performing at the same time. And you're just, if you're a newcomer and you've never seen anything like that, you're just like, whoa, wow, a lot of activity here <laughs> in this place. And that's... I, I can't exactly describe it from an outside perspective, but I remember the first time my wife met my family. And uh, she's like, wow, <laughs> a lot of personality there. And uh, so, and, but you know, you ask, what happened? Man, I mean, it just depends on what you report on what happened, because a lot happens when we get together. Well, that's sort of like the church service. I mean, it's got, I've got something to teach, and I've got something to, you know, I'm gonna, I've got a psalm that I'm going to share, and I'm going to speak, and it's just like busy. It just gets real in the church. The atmosphere is like, a lot happening, a lot going on, and kind of makes your head spin a little bit. It's a little overwhelming. And, and, and uh, the, the Scripture says then, we see uh, the six ways that tongues need to be done unto edifying. So here we go, beginning in verse 27. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret Okay, so now, if we're going to do this, Paul said, here's how to do it. Okay, so I told you, I'm going to tell you how to speak in tongues. Well, it, it goes like this. Before service, you know, I was in the back room, and before service, several folks came early, and we just chatted this evening. But supposing, hypothetically, maybe somebody came in early, like Gio came in early, Anthony was here early, uh, Andrew was here early. Suppose they came in and said, hey, Pastor, i got something I'd like to share with the church tonight. You know, I feel led by the Spirit to say something or whatever, and so they tell me what they're going, what they'd like to share. Like, can I share my testimony in the service this evening, uh, or whatever? And, and they ask about it. Now, how would you like it if we just opened the church every service? Now, sometimes that's nice, isn't it? Sometimes on a Sunday evening we'll say, you know, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, and people will just testify. But how would you like it if you came to church on a Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and you just didn't know what was going to happen. Matter of fact, nobody did. It was just like some whoever wanted to could do whatever they wanted. How many of y'all... Now, once in a while, that may be entertaining, but I'll tell you, you wouldn't want to repeat performance of that very often, would you? Uh, your, your plan when you come on a, to a regular service is that the preacher is, has a message. Something from the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. I mean, that's what a message is. is what preaching is God says. You want to hear from God, right? And you want it to be from the Word of God. And, uh, you know, you, you want certain things that ought to be in a service to be there. And, uh, you know, it's not that we're inflexible. We don't want any variation. But the fact is, is that we don't want to just come together randomly. That's not the way the body's supposed to come together. And particularly in the matter of tongues. So supposing this evening, let's say Gio was here, Anthony was here, Andrew was here, uh, Brother John was here early. Supposing all those guys had come in. So that would be Anthony, just four, right? Anthony, Gio, Andrew, and uh, Brother Brother John. So that would be four guys. Supposing all of them came in this evening and said, Pastor, tonight I want to, I, I have a message uh, from the Lord and I want to give it in a, in, in a tongue. 
Supposing they said that. Well, how many of them how many of them will we have time for? Maybe, but the Bible says two or maybe three. Two or three. Okay. So can all four of them give a message in tongues? No. I'd have to say, well, guys, let's let's well, let's work this out here because we don't, you know, it's just too much to have four guys speak in tongues. If you came this evening and uh, literally one of these men could speak a language, Malaysian to say, and uh, we had somebody that actually was coming to the service tonight. So here's my question. I would be, first of all, well, what tongue are you going to speak in tonight? In other words, two or three, okay, well, we're going to decide which of the two or three are going to. And of course, if in honor we prefer one another, that shouldn't be too complicated, should it? Every person could say, well, you know what, you go ahead. So two, we agree on two. Guys, let's just have two tonight. It's going to be too much if we have more than two people speak in tongues tonight. Who's your interpreter? What language are you going to speak in? Who's your interpreter? Charlie. Yeah, Mrs. Dolan says Charlie. Okay, so everybody's like, Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. Okay, all right. Does Charlie know the language? Okay, all right, so he's inter Do you see this? So the Bible says if you're going to speak in tongues, you have to do it, no more than two or three, and uh, you have to have an interpreter. You've got to do it in order, and you have to do an interpreter. So it's an order of service. When the conclusion here is let everything be done decently and in order, we're supposed to have an order of service in the church. This idea of getting together and just letting anybody spew nonsense on a whim is not church. We're supposed to be orderly about it, on purpose, with a purpose, and we're supposed to have a real message. It's not, well, I just want to speak in tongues so people know I'm gifted. No, I have a message. And the way you're going to know I have a message is, you know, Brother Charlie knows Malaysian, and I'm going to, I'm going to share the message in Malaysian, and he's going to tell you what I said, and you'll know. Charlie will definitely be convinced when he hears me speak Malaysian. No question about it. You understand? So that's the, the formality. Now let me ask you a question. If you've ever been to a church where they speak in tongues, how many of you have ever seen it done that way? How's it happen? Well, you're in the middle of service and people start just popping off, right? Just randomly. And then somebody, I know, I, maybe the way I phrase things isn't so nice, but, uh, you know, it's just somebody's like, blah, 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 and then somebody else, blah, 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 you know, and, and it just goes all, and then pretty soon everybody's doing it all at once. And it's, and it's just chaotic. And if somebody who doesn't know God comes in, it's going to just spook them. They're just going to say, this is spooky. What, I don't know what this is, but it's scary and I don't like it. You know, Or they'd be like, yeah, I like scary stuff. You know, And uh, I, that's what's going to attract it. But the reality of it is, actually, right? It's, that's not the gospel. That's not the message of the church, is it? So two or three in order and with an interpreter. In verse 28, the Bible says, so, so who's going to interpret tonight, Brother Charlie? Okay, so our answer is, well, you know Brother Charlie's running late tonight. And so you can you can just go ahead and cancel yourself. <laughs> Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> I just couldn't help with that. I had to bring that one in. Uh, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silent. Oh, by the way, Brother Andrew instituted church discipline. Uh, we were gonna write a Babylon B article. But this is all Brother Andrew's idea. He said that we're gonna start having church discipline. Every minute you're late, you get a SWAT. But only up to thirty nine. Only up to 39, 40 save one because our law, church discipline law, won't allow for any more than that. So, you know, just be ready next week. Andrew's holding you, I'm swatting you. So. All He's right. not even going to be here next week to defend himself. Oh, good. All right. Now, <laughs> all right, that, that's just nonsense. That doesn't belong. I just added it for good measure. Verse 28. There be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. That's the rule. So that's rule number one and two. You have to do it in order, and you have to have an interpreter. And if you don't, then keep your mouth shut. Keep silence is what it says. I guess that's nicer. That, that's, that's more uh, politely put, isn't it? Then keep your mouth shut. All right? Verse 29. Here's the third one. Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> Pastor. I have a message from the Lord tonight. You going to speak it in tongues? No, I'm going to speak it in English. Okay, who's your judge? 
I judged a couple guys on Facebook today. Now, I'm serious. I had guys message me, and they gave me prophetic messages, and I just told them that contradicts Scripture, and I gave them the Scripture for it, and that was the end of the conversation. They deleted me on Facebook. And <laughs> Not really. But the reality of it is, is if you try to tell me God says something, and I can open God's book, His Word, the Bible, and the Bible says something differently, your message isn't true. Or if you're claiming something the Bible says you can't claim. You pronounce a blessing on me, you never met me, you never know me, and you say this and this and this and this is going to be a blessing for you. And I just say, hath God said? Did God say that? I judge the message on the basis of what I know the Word of God to say. And if it does not coincide with the Scripture, my friend, they're a false prophet and they ought to be put to death. Or at least blocked or deleted off of Facebook. Okay. Well, the Scripture says if there's a prophet... And he comes, Pastor, I have, a, I have a message from God. It's prophecy tonight. Okay, who are your judges? You only have two or three, and you have to have a judge. Somebody that takes the Word of God. Somebody who's known to have wisdom. Someone who knows the Word of God. And they are going to say, yes, God did say that. In other words, somebody that God said the same thing to. Matter of fact, that's supported in the next several verses. Let's look at this because it's kind of unique. Uh, in verse 30, if anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. So, you say, I have a message of prophecy, and you have your judge standing by, and you stand up and you say, thus saith the Lord, and a guy that's coming up third goes, I was going to say that. Well, when it's his turn, he says, I don't have anything to say. I'm get up and say the same thing again. In other words, you agree with the Scripture, you agree with uh, what's known of God, but it's not repeti re repetitive. or repetitive is titious. I'm going to try to George Bush a word. Brother John and I were talking about that earlier today. <laughs> All right. Uh, if, it, if it's uh, repetitive, don't, don't do it. Then, verse 32, we see, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to to the prophets. You ever notice that oftentimes a person who claims to be a prophet is sort of a lone ranger or i.e. a rebel? Mm -hmm. A lot of times they don't want to be a student of the Scripture and learn what the Word of God says and teach what the Word of God says. I'm just telling you, people that I know that claim to be prophets, what I've found is they spend very little time in this book and they're lazy. And so kind of their response to knowing the Word of God or their way of having power over people is to be a prophet because it's easy to claim God said something, particularly if it cannot be corroborated by the Scripture. And the fact is, is that it's, that's a trick. It's a tactic. But the Bible says the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. It's not one of these, don't you try and tell me anything, I'm a prophet. I've had people give me a message. I say, well, the Bible says, oh, I'm, don't tell me what the Bible says. I am a prophet. Are you questioning? you calling into question my, uh, my gift of prophecy? Yes. And yes, precisely. That's exactly what I'm doing. Because you're contradicting the Scripture. The, spirit of the prophets, spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. In other words, if someone really said that to you, it wasn't God. By the way, could we pause here for a minute and just say, that if a person is not knowingly babbling, if something is an actual language that they're speaking, and they don't know what the message is, and there's no interpreter for it, might it not be very, very possible that the person who is speaking to them is a devil instead of God? Mm -hmm. Certainly is so. I remember back in the 1990s when the Brownsville movement was happening up in the Pensacola area, Man, I'll tell you something. I watched some videos of what those people were doing. Those were devils. Those were devils that were in that so-called, it wasn't a church, but a so-called church. A couple of ex-convicts had started this big organization. and I mean, it was massive. And there was all kinds of scandal and fraud going along with it. And they were claiming to be prophets and they were speaking these, quote, supernatural messages. And you would watch the services and it was crazy. People were in the aisles barking like dogs. There was a man leading another man on a leash and somebody going, where he leads me, I will follow where he leads me, I will follow. Just nonsense. God didn't do that. God didn't do that. That was a devil in that organization. Those were devils in that place. And I'm, 
uh, not at all hesitant to say so. <clears throat> I spoke with individuals that were involved with that movement. And when I, when I questioned them regarding the gospel, man, they didn't want to be questioned about what the gospel was. They were val validated by their, quote, supernatural gifts. And the things they were doing were earthly, sensual, and devilish. And so that was a devil. Those were devils in that, quote, or uh, assembly. It wasn't a church in the sense that we would understand a church. Now, then, here is a side note. Verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Do you hear that? Isn't, that? isn't that a sweet verse? So when you go into a church, and it is literally just an uproar. Uh, this whole holy roar thing, you heard the phrase holy roar today, where they have blended worship, and uh, people, you know, they, they talk about the praise and the singing as a holy roar. My friend, what that is is akin to what Moses heard when he came down off of the mount and when he said there's a noise of war in the camp. That's holy roar. And what that actually was was worship of an idol, worship of Baal. And I'll tell you, what goes on in churches and it's called praise and worship is confusion. It is not uh, done by God. God is not doing it. God is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all churches of the saints. Hear me now. Don't turn me off. Don't get offended by what I, the, by the way that we've applied the Scripture this evening. Don't get, don't get all upset about it. Hear it and listen to it. Consider whether it's so. Ought not a church be a place that you ought to go and the only person disrupting in that place would be the one who is the convincer, the convictor, the Holy Ghost? In other words, you don't need to hear a man raging. You don't need to hear a woman or a man, you know, out of control. The only thing that ought to be taking away peace is conviction. Or as the Holy God, Spirit of God puts a finger on you, I've seen people in a very, very peaceful setting literally writhing. I've seen people stand up, and I've seen them grab a hold of the chairs in front of them, and I mean, you can hear their knuckles popping. They're gripping them so hard because they're hanging on. They're just, the Spirit of God is convincing and convicting them. They're under great, terrible conviction, real conviction by the Holy Spirit of God. I've seen people break out into a cold sweat. Their faces turn beet red when they're sitting in a very, very peaceful setting when the Word of God is just being plainly laid forth and, and uh, simply preached. And I've seen the conviction of the Holy Ghost. Now, God is not causing confusion there. The individuals there know exactly what God is saying. It is their resisting His Holy Spirit that's causing uh, the lack of peace. But that's individual, not corporate. There'd be a great spirit of peace in the assembly. You ever been somewhere and somebody's all bent out of shape and they're all agitated about the message that was preached? And you leave and you're like, what is your problem, man? What are you upset about? What's there to be upset about? You ever been the person who's agitated? Man, I can't believe Pastor said that today. I mean, he has crossed the line. I cannot believe. And so, like, what's your deal, man? He didn't say anything offensive. But you're offended. Why is that? Well, because you got convicted by the Holy Spirit of God. In other words, the Word of God did what it did, and it came and it just did. It's, the Bible says God's Word is quick and powerful. Quick means alive, and it's sharpening two edged sword. And uh, it is able to discern, or it's, it's able to divide between the joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. God can do that. And He's certainly doing that with His Word here this evening. I think that we could give a witness of that, couldn't we? When the truth is preached, the Spirit of God says, it's true. It has a ring of truth about it where you can actually say, yes, I know what the Word of God says. I believe probably tonight in this service, I would certainly believe in a, in a group, even the size of ours tonight, that there would be individuals that are seeing what the Word of God clearly says and the Spirit of God is just putting a stamp of approval on what is said. Yes, that's the way tongues are. Yes, that's the truth about prophecy. Yes, and when you hear it, you just, you're just fully assured. And actually, by the time you leave here tonight, you couldn't be convinced of anything otherwise because you know the truth. And that's the way truth is. It's peaceful, isn't it? Isn't a wonderful thing, no truth? Man, when you don't know something and you're uncertain about something, that's when you get agitated, isn't it? But when you know the truth, and that's when it's very, very, there's a spirit of peace about it. And then here's another one for you, and some of y'all may not like this. Hang on, verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Now, Pastor, what does that mean? Well, it means precisely what it says. 
That's why this evening we don't have a lady preaching in our church this evening because a lady is not supposed to uh, preach in the church. That's what the Bible says. See, Pastor, that's bigoted society. That's that's just first. I've heard I've heard uh, individuals who are uh, just completely out of step with the Scripture, like Joyce Meyer, and I've uh, heard people supporting you know the quote preaching that she does and saying you know that's you know the only reason that's in the Bible is because it was locked in the first century culture. Friend, listen to me. Anyone who says that is wholly, entirely ignorant of first century culture. First. First, okay? Um, secondly, it completely ignores that the church was the one place. The believers were the only people who valued women as equals. It's interesting, you know, like Sunday night, wasn't it wonderful when we looked at that message of Aquila and Priscilla and their example? Isn't it interesting that the Bible just talked about Priscilla just as much as a part of that family and a part of the ministry and as much as one who helped Apollos? It didn't say, you know, Aquila helped bring Apollos to further understanding. It was Aquila and Priscilla, the two of them. So the Scripture does not in any way devalue the mind of a woman or the equal, uh, the equality of a woman. But what it's talking about is, is spiritual leadership. And you can balk at this, and you can have a problem with it, but the real issue here this evening is that you know it's actually true what the Bible says. Uh, ladies, you know you are created special, don't you, by God, for certain things that men are not created for. And men, you know that you're created special. You know, differences in a man and a woman are not a bad thing. I would be very, very unattracted to my wife if she were the same as me. Isn't it so? And truthfully, my wife would be very unattracted to me if I were the same as her. God made us different. And I wouldn't want someone like me, and she wouldn't want someone like her. God made us different and distinct because that's His perfect plan. In, in God's eyes, there's neither male nor female. There's neither a bond nor free. There's neither Jew nor Greek. Uh, we're all one in Christ Jesus. And so it's not, we're not talking about equality as far as God's value. This isn't a value mention here. It's a role mention. Matter of fact, you could get offended for the same thing this evening because you show up at church tonight and I don't let you preach because I'm the preacher. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. In other words, you say, well, pastor, what gives you the right to, be, to preach tonight? Well, the fact that I'm the pastor gives me the right to preach tonight. Who makes that determination? Well, y'all do. Y'all do. I can't be your pastor without your allowing it or without your desiring it, can I? No, not at all. Uh, you say, well, who made the determination, male or female? Who did? God did. Is there anything wrong with that? This evening, you come here and you say, well, just because I'm not the pastor, it's just not fair. Well, you've got something wrong with you if you're thinking that way. You'll be a real problem to yourself and others if that's the way you think. And if you're here this evening, you're male and female, and you have a problem with what God made and the way God made it, you'll have a real problem as well. Does that make sense? And, you know, society does not dictate or determine what God thinks or what is truth. And if you align yourself with what God says is truth, my friend, you'll be lined up straight. And things will be functional. You know, a lot of times, because we disagree with God, we get it bent out of shape. We get out of sorts. And that's no kind of way to live. God made you. And the only way you'll be right is to be what He made you to be. So, I hope that's practical for you here this evening. So, uh, a lady comes and she says, Pastor, I'm supposed to speak in tongues this evening. What's the response? No, Wrong gender. Can't happen. Now let me ask you a question. If you've been in a church where they speak in tongues, who are the majority speaking in tongues? Women. Yeah, usually women. Normally more women than men. Now, I'm just saying this not to be mean or critical. I'm saying it because we need to be thinkers as believers. And we be, need to be asking the question, these individuals say God is saying this. Is God really saying this? See, what are we doing? Well, that we're judging the spirit of the prophets, aren't we? By doing that, we're taking the word of God and we're saying, can this be true? Well, if it were true, it wouldn't be her saying it. If it were true, it would have been the first two guys, not the fifth guy. See? Isn't that a help? So, I've been in services before where people stand up and start babbling, 
And I'll tell you, it just goes on and on and on. It's tough to get out of there because those people, it's like they got their minute. You know, they got their time to shine, their moment for attention. I went to a church that didn't speak in tongues, but really did things out of order like this. They had every Sunday morning, they only had one service a week, and every Sunday morning they opened it up for praise and uh, prayer requests. And oh man, there were a couple ladies that just dominated. It was like you'd be there, you're, you're there, it's, it's, you're an hour into the service, and you've just heard like three ladies go on and on and on and on, telling the story about blah, 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 blah. And, and you say, Pastor, that's just so mean. No, I just don't go to church to be there all day to hear people carry on for no reason. I want to hear, at some point, the Word of God. And I don't mind a little bit of a, a personality in it. Do you? I don't mind if somebody tells a story or gives an illustration or somebody picks on Charlie or something like that. That's fine. But the, I got him awake. But the reality of it is that I, that's not what we go to the fellowship for, for the body for, and that's the way the church had been at Corinth. Now, doesn't it make you feel better to know that in the first century they had problems in the church? And we shouldn't be glad people had problems, but aren't you glad that it wasn't just, it didn't just happen then? It, it isn't just happening now, I should say, but it happened then as well. And I find that encouraging because, you know what? If they could get help, so can we. Now, verse 35, if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for women to speak in the tr church. It, it ought to go without saying that we're talking about public speaking, doesn't it? In other words, if one of you ladies leans over to someone beside you and say, what page was that in the hymn book? We're not talking about, don't speak in church. You know, uh, I, I've met people before, and they're just bigots. That's all they are. I've met people before, the, the husbands who required their wives when they came into the church to, uh, you know, you, you walk in the church, you don't say a word until you walk out. <laughs> I know guys like that. Charlie does too. Uh, you know, and Charlie knows all kinds of people. He knows snake handlers. He knows, you name it. He's, he's been there. Uh, the reality of it is, is that I know people like that, but they're, they're bigots. That isn't what the scripture's teaching at all, is it? What, what's our context this evening? We're talking about prophecy, aren't we? We're talking about a word. Uh, we're talking about uh, speaking in tongues. That's, a, that's our context tonight. And that brings us to an understanding that when a person speaks in tongues, there's a purpose in their message. There's something for the church that edifies. There's, God says, and it's something you're going to learn. And so uh, a lady's not supposed to be the one teaching that. Now, in verse 36, there's a, there's a concluding argument. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? The notion that individuals cannot arrive at truth unless they get it from, oh, I've got a... I've got a no, this is the way God gives truth. And if it can't be given in this way, then it's just ancillary. It's just extra. It's not from God. That's the idea here. If... Five people stand up and speak in tongues. First of all, if the message is true, there will be just overlap. And at a certain point, you just don't need to hear the overlap again. You ever met the guy that preaches the message after the message is over? I try not to when I'm a pastor. You know, a preacher comes as a guest speaker and he preaches a message and, and has me get up to give the conclusion, which is very dangerous. And you, then you're given the conclusion. And the guy giving the conclusion re-preaches the text. And it's like, we just heard it preached. You know, give the invitation. Let's respond to the message. We don't need the message preached again, same thing that was just said. Counselors do that sometimes. You know, when you have a someone who at the end of a service will be there with the Bible in case somebody needs just some help or some answers. But what they do is they re-preach the message again. You don't need to do that. You just need to, if somebody's come, if they've responded to the message, you just lead them to a decision. Okay, what did God say? All right, what are you going to do? Well, then I'm here to witness that. And let's you tell God what you just told me. They tell God what you just what they just told you, and uh, then maybe you give them a verse to encourage them, something else, something extra. But uh, you don't need to re-preach the same message that was just preached. It's nonsense. It's unnecessary. And that's what the scripture here is saying. Um, and then look at verse thirty-seven. No person, no person who is unwilling to submit themselves to these requirements is valid or legitimate. Look at verse 37. If any man think himself be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. 
That's a pretty good litmus test, isn't it? If the condition, if the person thinks that they're spiritual, then let them, let them acknowledge that what I said is true. That's what Paul said. It's incredible how individuals try to vaunt themselves against someone else. It was a very problem that they had in that Paul addressed in the beginning of his letter. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ. And by following one, they were rejecting another. All of them were supposed to be following Jesus. And if you think that you can be spiritual and reflect, reject God-given Bible authority, you're not. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, if anybody doesn't want to abide by this, oh, you know what, we'll just start a church and we'll have five people if we want to. We'll let the ladies if they want to. And we'll prophesy overlapping if we want to. And we'll... And Paul said, if anybody doesn't want to do it the right way, just know what's going on. Know what it is. What it is, it's the spirit of rebellion. And it isn't the spirit of Christ. If anyone thinks they're spiritual, let them acknowledge what we say is true. I dare you this evening to challenge the Word of God. Not me. It's, it's not my message. I preached the Word of God, didn't I, tonight? Mm -hmm. Bible said it, not me. Isn't it so? Okay. Let me ask you the question then. Do you accept it? Well, Pastor, I know a lady who's a prophet and she speaks in tongues. Where at? Is her message coincidental with the Scripture? Or does it contradict the Scripture? If it's the same as what the Scripture teaches, why do you need her? That's my follow-up question. Right? In other words, if I could show you what the Word of God said, would you rather I showed you what the Word of God said or would I rather give you a supernatural message from you, from me to you? Where you would have to go through the validating of me. Whereas if I give you a message and I tell you God said it, I have to be validated, don't I? I have to be tested by the Word of God and by people that are under the authority of the Word of God and that are spiritual. Isn't it a lot simpler just to say God said and just open the book where it's said? And that's the whole point of Paul's conclusion here tonight. So let's ask a couple of concluding questions. Pastor, is there any such thing as supernatural uh, word of knowledge from God today? Is that the question everybody has here tonight? Today in the church, is there any such thing as a supernatural or special word of knowledge from God? Um, it won't be additionally do additional doctrinal. In other words, my first thing I would say is, if it is, it will not be in addition to the Word of God. If the Word of God already says it, it's unnecessary, right? Do we agree about that? If the Bible already teaches it, why do I need why do I need God to give it to you extra biblically? I don't. Okay, so then it would be a personal message, wouldn't it? You ever felt led to call somebody and say, "How you doing?" Have you? Yeah. Who led you? Well, God did, didn't He? It's a word of knowledge, isn't it? Of course, I've been spirit-led to ask a question. I've been spirit-led to say something before. It's not doctrinal, it's personal. Right? You know, I haven't seen anything that corroborates this, so don't feel like, you know, I know something or I'm accusing you of anything. But I just feel led to ask you this question. I've asked people a question before, man, I put my finger right on something I had no idea about. Who led me to do that? Well, the Spirit of God did. So, do I believe in a word of knowledge? Do I? Yes. But it is not doctrinal. Do you see the difference? Uh, and I would say that today, what the Scripture says in the test for prophecy I would say then that if anything is prophetic in the sense that it's a supernatural message or a word from God, that it would be individual and it certainly would be supported. Man, and I've had people try to pull that stunt with me too. 
I just sense that something's going on between you and your wife. Man, there isn't anything going on between me and, well, yeah, yeah never mind. No, <laughs> no, the reality, I've had people try that stunt on me before, you know, they're just guessing, you know, you're a pastor, so you and your wife must have problems at home. You know, they're guessing, they, you know, they're, well, here's what I think's going on. No, it's not. You know, you're just trying to pretend to be spiritual. And the people that know, know it isn't so. So that's pretend, isn't it? Uh, but could it ever be valid? Well, if it's valid, you'll know it is. Matter of fact, it'll go against your uh, human desire, human impulse. You won't want to go around meddling in secret things in people's lives. You'll be saying, man, if I say that to them, they're going to think I'm nuts. I don't want to do that. But the Holy Spirit of God will say, you say that to them. And you're like, okay, all right. You understand the difference? between somebody just wanting to pretend, hey, you know what? God tells me things nobody else knows. i got supernatural secret knowledge. Well, it's all about look at me. Other, otherwise, it's edify the body. Isn't that the point? Isn't that the purpose of spiritual gifts? To profit with all? Oh, no. Somebody's alarm went off. That must mean my wife said, she said, when my watch goes off, you better be done. So we're going to have problems at home if I don't get done with this really quickly. So here's the conclusion. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Decently and in order. Now, what's the order? Well, it's precisely as the Scripture laid out. So, there you have it, folks. That's how to speak in tongues. Do you know how? Let's go over it. You tell me, how do we speak in tongues? Let's start from the beginning and do a review. How does it begin? We're going to have tongues tonight in our church. How are we going to do it? It has to be between two or three people. It has to be a translator. Okay, so two or three people, and there it has to be a spoken language with the translator. So yeah, this is who's going to interpret. Yes. Male. Okay, it has to be a man. Yeah. Why do ladies always say that? <laughs> what else? They have to acknowledge it with being written with the man. Okay, so it has to acknowledge that. Yeah, the Word of God is the authority. Yes, Josiah? I was going to say, you have to be, have a judge. It's prophecy. You have to be judged. That prophet. Now let me ask you a question. Who made that all up? What? God did. God did. Did Pastor Price make that up? As soon as you walk out of here mad at me. All right? I've had people, Pastor, I don't appreciate that message at all. Well, it's not right for you to get angry at me for something God said. Hath God said? Yes. This isn't my message. I found it in the Bible. And I find that there's some pretty good messages there, don't you? Father, thank you for what we've learned tonight. Please help us to absorb it and help us to be able to edify one another with it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's take some prayer requests this evening.